Well, hey, I just want to say thank you for tuning in again. We are so glad you're here and thanks for the response. We love the comments. We love when you share some of the material you find on the YouTube channel and we love that you invite your friends to subscribe. So thank you for doing that. And today I just want to encourage you with something that just sort of leapt off the page and personally encouraged me. Have you ever worked a puzzle with your kids? Like we love jigsaw puzzles and so we'll get a 500 piece puzzle out. We're like finding all the edge pieces and we're trying to get, you know, all the colors grouped together. And when we're coming into that home stretch where you can see that you have like four or five pieces left and we get down to there's, there's one piece left, inevitably, my son will have the last piece of the puzzle in his pocket. He's been waiting for this moment for him to be the hero and finish the masterpiece, plug his piece in. And he just wants us to clap and cheer. And the kid's 12 years old. So I realize I've created a monster. But I was thinking about that experience. And for so many believers, we are sitting around holding the spiritual gifts that God has given us. Like we're holding that last piece of the puzzle. We don't necessarily want to plug in while we're doing the grunt work of the edges or doing the grunt work of figuring out what's sky and what's ocean. We want to hold on to that gift to the last possible moment when the picture is perfectly clear and we can sail in and to da be that finishing crowning piece. Well, that's not how it's supposed to work. And I want to share a story that will encourage you today to get your gift out and plug it into the puzzle, into the scene that God has you in right now. The story is in 2 Kings 22, and it centers around a woman whose name you've probably never even heard. Her name is Hulda, but you have heard of this guy, probably. His name's King Josiah. He became king when he was eight years old. Here's the backstory. It's 722 BC and Israel is a hot mess. They've introduced cultic practices, child sacrifice, male prostitutes. It is a bad, bad time to be in Israel. And Josiah's dad was a guy named Manasseh. And he did so much evil in the eyes of the Lord. Scripture actually says he did more evil than the heathens that the Lord drove out before Israel. So no bueno. So Josiah is eight years old and his mother is godly and he assumes the throne. And he grows up and scripture tells us he has a hunger for the things of God. Well, he's about 16, 20 years old and he looks at the high priest and he says, look, let's get this temple in order. I want you to take the money box out of the temple, hire some craftsmen. Let's get this place ready for people to worship. Well, the high priest goes in there to get the money and he stumbles across something. It's this lost book of the law. And it's like antiques roadshow on steroids. He doesn't even know what he has, but he goes to the king's secretary and he goes, I found something huge. I don't know what it is, but it was hidden in the temple under this box of stuff. And this could be a big deal. So the king's secretary goes to the king and he says, the high priest found this stuff. Well, the king's like, read it to me. So the secretary starts reading and we don't know what he read exactly, but we do know it had a profound effect on King Josiah. He tears his clothes and he tells the secretary and he tells the high priest, he says, go inquire of the Lord, find someone who can tell us what we need to do at this point. Because if this book is true, we're in a big heap of trouble. That's the Sarah International Version. You can read all about it in 2 Kings. So at this time, there are some pretty famous prophets ministering in Israel. We know from scripture that Jeremiah is ministering in 722 BC during King Josiah's reign. We know Zephaniah is ministering during King Josiah's reign. These guys have books of the Bible named after them. So they're kind of a big deal. But the king's high priest, the king's secretary, and two other guys go knock on the door of a woman named Huldah. And she was a prophetess, the wife of the keeper of the royal wardrobe, and she lived in the second quarter of Jerusalem. 
That's all scripture tells us about her. But there was something about her gift and her anointing that led these four incredibly smart and elevated men to her door. And in that moment, she has a choice. Is she going to hide that puzzle piece? Is she going to question whether or not she's going to come forward with the interpretation that these men are seeking? Or is she just going to walk through the door that's been opened for her? Well, scripture tells us that Huldah opens the door to these men. And if you read her response to them four times, She says, thus saith the Lord. She operates in her gifting and big things happen. And we can learn three lessons from Huldah. Three lessons that you and I can apply the next time we're wondering how to apply our gift. If we're wondering, is now the time for me to put that piece down? The first one is this, your gift will make room for you. Your gift will make room for you. You don't have to chase what God will bring to you if you will stay hungry and stay obedient. Hulda wasn't out hawking her wares as a prophetess. She wasn't competing with Jeremiah and Zephaniah. She was walking in her assignment as the wife of the royal keeper of the wardrobe in the second district, second quarter of Jerusalem. And when the door had a knock on it, she opened it. Her gift made room for her. If you and I will be effective, God will make us known. If you and I will just strive to be effective in our calling, effective in the gifts that he's given us, God will work and elevate us and make us known. So that's the first thing. Your gift will make room for you. And also I want to challenge you, be a steward in the little things. I challenge my kids all the time. Keep your room clean. Keep your room clean. Funny story. My son actually asked me, mom, when Avery and I move out, who's going to do all your chores for you? I laughed and laughed and laughed because I thought, child, when you move out, my chore list is getting cut in half because I spend half my day picking up your underwear off the bathroom floor. But all that to say, I am not having my kids do chores because I want to sit around eating bonbons. Although the thought has crossed my mind. I have my kids doing chores because if they can be a steward with the room that their father and I have given them, then they'll be ready for their own apartment. If they can learn how to wash my dishes after we all have a meal together, then they'll be ready to load their own dishwasher when the Lord calls them to their own place. If you and I will be faithful in little things, we'll prove that we can be trusted with much and our gifts will make room for us. The second takeaway I wanna challenge you with is this, you are the messenger, not the message. I heard a pastor put it this way, you're the bush, not the fire. (laughs) God, has a powerful message that he wants to work through you to impart strength to the people around you. You are the messenger, not the message. If you look at Huldah's response in 2 Kings, four times she says, thus saith the Lord. She was clear, She was confident and she was those things because she knew in that moment she was operating under her gifting through the Holy Spirit. Proverbs puts it this way. It's Proverbs 326. The Lord himself will be your confidence. Huldah did not reach back and use her wisdom of ancient Hebrew text. She didn't reach back and look at the the manuscript and say, yes, I think this is appropriately dated. This, This does appear to be a reputable text. In that moment, Huldah reached back and she tapped into the gift that the Holy Spirit that God had bestowed on her and she operated in confidence because she knew these are not my words, these are the Lord's words. And she just spoke it clearly, eloquently, and on point. And that's probably why the men knocked on her door. She had a reputation of not being someone who was about the flash in the pan. She had a reputation for someone who was about the things of the Father and she could be trusted with it. So the last thing is, our last takeaway, do not underestimate the second chair. Hulda gives this response to the men. She says, go back and tell your king this. Yes, the Lord is going to bring judgment. 
because yes, these things have, have not been addressed properly. Oh, by the way, the book that the high priest stumbled across, many theologians believe it was the book of Deuteronomy that he, he ran into. So that's kind of a big deal. And she says, but tell the king this, because he tore his clothes in my presence, because he was repentant, because he is hungry for the things of God, he is not going to see the destruction. I'll bring peace in his lifetime. So the four men leave Hulda and they go and they tell the king everything. And something remarkable happens. In 2 Kings 23, Josiah gathers the people together and he strikes a covenant with God and he leads the most sweeping religious reforms Israel has ever seen. In fact, 2 Kings 23, 25, I have to read this verse to you. It says, there was no king like him before or after who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, all of his soul and his might, according to the law of Moses. King Josiah comes after David. This verse says that no one before or after him. This means Josiah's heart was more hungry for the things of the Lord, more committed to the law of the book of Moses than all of the kings before him. Solomon, David, that's a pretty tall order. Because one woman was confident enough in her spiritual gift not to have to be in charge, but to be able to be confident, to be able to speak the word of the Lord and to be in the second chair. The people of God in this season of COVID, of 2020, of crazy, God is not looking for his kingdom to have more programs. Those are not the answers. He is looking for men and women of God who he can work through and equip with these gifts so that he can demonstrate his power through us for his people, for his kingdom, for his agenda. If you and I will use the gifts God has given us for his glory, there is no limit to what we can accomplish. Hulda was a wife, a woman living in a second quarter of Jerusalem, someone who's never mentioned before in scripture and certainly never mentioned after, but she steps on the stage at a divine moment and because of her obedience, a king starts a righteous revolution and the people and the nation are changed for it. In this season, God could be calling you in this moment to step in a divine stage for just such a season. Walk through the door that's open to you. Sometimes that's your kitchen table where you're equipping your children. Use your gifts in that setting. Sometimes it's teaching Sunday school. Use your gifts in that, in that setting. Sometimes it's the water cooler at your office. Use your gift in that setting. And when you've proven yourself in those settings, more and more opportunities and doors will open to you. God is just looking for faithfulness and he's looking for obedience and he's looking for people, the scripture says, and whom he can prove himself strong. I sign up for that every day. I would love to be in a place where I'm weak enough that God can prove himself strong in me. So I hope that encourages you today to step out in faith and use the gift that God has given you. And here's a tip. He's put gifts in every single one of us. He intends to use every single one of us, not just the super flashy, not just the super talented, but every single person. And I want to encourage you next time we get together, I'm going to talk to you about someone who got a little ahead of themselves in their gift, because when you and I let pride creep in there, things can go haywire fast. So next time we meet, I'm going to talk to you about a gal who didn't exactly lean into wisdom when it came to her spiritual gift, but there's a lot we can learn from her too. So I can't wait to talk to you then. Mm -hmm.